it's not just my idea that that these are terrible times. It's a biblical. It's a biblical uh, prophecy that said that the last times would be terrible times. There's been evil in the world ever since the fall of man. Evil's not new. Sin isn't new. You, you know, we could look back through history and we could just find just grotesque genocides and abuses and manipulations and power-hungry leaders. We could find it all throughout history, but the Bible does say that there's going to be something especially terrible about the last days. And we're certainly in those last days, and I want to once again remind you that the biblical view of the last days is not like the last two days before Jesus comes. The biblical view is that from the time that Christ first came until his return, the second time, those are the last days. So we've been living in 2,000 years now of the last days. And the good thing is that God doesn't get in a hurry. Aren't you happy for that? Uh, not only are those there those in our midst, in, in our culture, and in our world that don't look like they're going to get saved, but they might still get saved, and God's patiently waiting for them. But God also patiently waited for you and me. You know, just think if He would have come back in the year 1,000, Oh, I'm, I'm glad he didn't. Amen. I'm glad that we're going to get a, a share eternity with him. The Lord knows the full number of people that are to be born upon the earth. He knows the full number that are going to be that are the heirs of salvation. And he's very patiently waiting for all of that. Thankfully, with the Lord, you know, sometimes we say, God, hurry up. He doesn't hurry. Uh, a year is uh, a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. Now, you can complain about that or you can also be happy. Now, you know, we're, I'm not preaching on prosperity this morning. Well, let me rephrase. I'm not preaching on God honoring wealth this morning. But, you know, God can take a thousand years of wealth and make it happen in a day. Don't always look at the other side that he'll make you wait a thousand years. He can do both. A thousand years is as a day and a day is as a thousand years. God can do more in a moment than you could do in a lifetime. Amen. So it does work both ways. But the Bible says that the last days, they're going to be terrible times, perilous times. We're living in them. There, there are some uniquely terrible things about these uh, times. All the mass shootings. There's an example for you of a uniquely terrible thing. Uh, you know, you couldn't have, that couldn't have really been possible in, uh, in, in the past. Uh, for much much of the past, I should say. You know, it's uniquely uh, terrible times. You think about uh, the power of the Internet and the control, I mean, of population that happens because of that. And, you know, that really wasn't possible in the last times. And, you know, I was just thinking this morning when I went in and I clicked on the Google, there are several people you can use. You can use, Bing, well, I don't even know. You can use Internet Explorer. You can use Google. Firefox. I don't, I'm not techie enough. There's several of these. But really, there aren't that many portals going onto the Internet. And when you go onto the Internet, they connect to Google. Now, I'm not an against Google, anti-Google guy. All right? But, but there's a lot of control happening on the Internet. Whether you, want to, whether you want to believe that or not, there's a lot of control happening as far as where your searches are being channeled. That's influencing your worldview a lot if you're on the Internet. Okay, now, now you say, Pastor, don't meddle. Too late. You're here. You're sitting down. We'll notice if you leave. Okay, I can tell you, I've spent a lot of time on the Internet. Now, if you give it some thought, you've spent a lot of time on the Internet this week. Raise your hand. I know, like, three of you don't have the Internet. So, like, five of you or something. It's, but I'm, a lot of you spent time on the Internet. Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. You'll be lying if you don't. See, you spent... And, and if you got your smartphone which I left down there. But if you got your smartphone, you spent time on the internet. And I'm not being anti-internet. I'm not being anti-Google. Don't cloud the message. What I'm saying is that these are uniquely terrible times. There has never been a time where so few people could control the psyche of so many. It's, it's not happened ever in history. Uh, ever in history. And even, you know, like with Google, even if you go to some other website, they're, they're latching into Google because Google's where it's at. You know, Silas likes watching all these uh, CNET tech shows on Roku, Roku or, and such. And, and uh, he was watching the one of Mark Zuckerberg, uh, who's the founder of Facebook. He's the Facebook guy. And he was talking about all how private Facebook is now becoming. 
And you could almost hear the snickers in the audience. Yeah, I mean, seriously. And he said, I know, I know, I know. It's hard for you to believe, but I assure you we're taking your privacy seriously. <laughs> you know, it was kind of funny to watch it, you know. But, it, I mean, it was like a silence. He said, you know, privacy is the next thing about Facebook. And it was like, you could just tell it caught him off guard. And he said, I know, I know. You find it hard to believe. Well, don't you find it hard to believe? Yes. Listen, I'm, the Bible says that there's going to be something, that the last days are going to be uniquely terrible. They are. They are uniquely terrible. There's always been darkness. There's always been evil in the world. But these are terrible times. Now, I don't like to go heavy. I just know that we got to share the whole story. Yes. All right? And we need to be aware of the days we're living in and the surrounding that we're in. Now, I am going to counter that by saying, as a believer, you don't need to get sucked up in the terrible times because you need to, by faith, know what God is doing through you, in the midst of you, and on behalf of you. Amen. Faith is the end of the story for the believer, right? So even as we look at the terrible times that we're in, we need to realize that God has placed us here to be light. God has placed us here to be salt in the world. But we just have to realize it's terrible times. So one of the the uniquely terrible things about the last times is this graying out. Grain, G-R-A-Y or G-R-E-Y. It depends. They're both accurate. I looked it up because I wanted to make sure I wasn't spelling it. Both are correct. G-R-E-Y or G-R-A-Y. Both are acceptable spellings. But the grain out of the culture, the grain out of it, and things are getting gray, especially in our culture. Yes. They are. And it is getting harder to navigate the gray areas within our culture. But as believers, we have to learn. We have to learn how to do it. Um, we have to learn how to be salt and how to be light in the gray areas. Because in the gray areas, that's where a lot of shipwreck happens. You, you know, that's like the fog. You can't see the, the rocks. You can't see the icebergs, you know, in the gray areas. And God has called us to be light and salt. Now, I don't think we need to run from the gray areas, I think we need to take them on. And we need to find out what God has to say. So I'm not going to do a lot of review on last week. And this is just really, it's not a deep theological uh, message, but it is spiritually meddling today. And it's not me meddling, it's the Holy Spirit meddling and requiring us to ask some of the hard questions regarding gray areas. Um, you know, that, I'm not your conscience. I'm not your Holy Spirit. I'm not your God. I'm not your Savior. I'm just sharing the word. And we have to make decisions of conscience. You know, you're not going to stand with me before Jesus, and I'm not going to stand with you before Jesus. Am I right about this? Yes. And this is one of the things, as we mature as believers, you know, we, we stand together, but yet we make decisions. And we have to consider matters of the conscience in this, this culture that's graying out. We saw last week how our culture is, has changing values, graying out values. There are still black and there are still white, but there are definitely some gray areas that we have to uh, learn to navigate with a clean conscience, okay? Uh, we saw that God's word never changes. We, of course, know that. And one of the reasons that things are graying out is because of the absence of the word. And if, see, it's, let's say it this way. Neither of these is bad. I'm only illustrating. If you have a factory job where you're working on the assembly line and your job is, is to put the screw in the socket, you put the screw, now let's make it simple. You put the screw in the nut, okay? Your job is to put the bolt in the nut. Let me get it right. Start over. Your job, you will stand here all day and you will put the bolt in the nut. You will do nothing else, but you will put the bolt in the nut and you will do it all day long. Well, that would be so boring, but yet there's a sense in which that would be reassuring because it's such a simple job. I just got to stand here and put the bolt in the nut, right? It's so simple. And you may be the kind of person that I just love this job because I just got to put the bolt in the nut all day long and I'm pretty good at doing that and I'm getting a paycheck about it. But then if you want to get promoted, what's going to happen is you're going to move up to where you have to start making decisions that are more gray concerning every, the whole operation because the whole operation isn't just putting the bolt in the nut. You might be building a car or something like that. All right. And so you got to, as you, you got to begin to learn how to make decisions in areas that are not black and white, cut and dry. As believers, there are both of those areas. There are black and white areas. We don't need to debate those. We need, we, there's no need to debate those, okay? We're given 10 commandments. 
That's not just Old Covenant. That's Old Covenant. That's New Covenant. We're given that more than ten, but I'm saying the Ten Commandments. Uh, Jesus says that all the commandments uh, and the law and the prophets hang upon love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second one like it, love your neighbor as yourself. There are commandments, okay? But as believers, we don't live under law. Because we are called, now that's not contradictory, there is a law, there always hasn't been a law, and there always will be a law. But we don't live under it in the sense of someone who is without Christ. Why? Because Christ has fulfilled the law for us. Amen. You know, I don't really want to go back into this, but I think you guys uh, get at least the, the spirit of that, the gist of that, because I, I really don't want to cover that. But, but uh, as, as we, we have to face things, the gray areas. We have to make decisions. We need the Holy Spirit's help to make decisions. One of the great, great ways of clearing up the gray areas is simply being in the Word. And when we choose not to read the Bible, and when we choose not to study the Bible as the Word of God, then what happens is things begin graying out. Simple. You say, Pastor, why do I have to... Why do you talk so much about reading the Bible? Well, because if you don't read the Bible, things are going to start graying out in your life. Decisions are going to get harder. The less you read the Bible, the more decisions are going to get harder. Now, that may sound old and dusty and archaic and boring like you've heard it a thousand times. Okay? But if you don't put the bolt, if you don't put the, the bolt in, in the nut, then you don't make the car. That's part of the process. And if you don't read the Bible... You don't move on to any of the other stuff. Yes. No, I don't care how crusty and old and dry and boring it is. I love Joyce Myers and Joel Osteen, but their book is not the first part of the process. Okay? Buying the latest open Bible leadership manual, whatever that might be, is not part of the process. Okay? And it's so elementary, but things begin to gray out when we're not renewed in the Word. Okay? We forget things. And there are things that we don't know. And if we study to show ourselves approved, we'll find some of those things. And it'll be easier to navigate those black and white areas. So, like I said, this is not a deep theological message. But it is, a, it is just a simple uh, encouragement, exhortation. Have you been reading the Word? It's easy to slip. I'm not bringing condemnation on you. I'm just asking a question. Have you been reading the Word? Uh, have you been listening to the Word? You can... I listen to the Word more than I read it because I, I play it off of my phone. I stream it all the time. <laughs> so you just have to uh, ask yourself that question. And don't answer it for someone else. Don't answer it for your pastor. Don't answer it for someone else in the congregation. Uh, because it's really a matter of you... See... Let me tell you what's comfortable. What's comfortable is where I tell you that if you don't read the Bible and pray an hour a day, you're out of the will of God. Now you say, Pastor, that's uncomfortable. That makes me... Well, I'm gonna tell you, that's comfortable because you can say, okay, I did read it an hour a day. I check it off the list. I'm better than the people that didn't read it in an hour a day. But when I say it's between you and the Holy Spirit, but you need to be reading your Bible every day, you know what that requires? Spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity, right? Because now you got to make decisions like, oh, this guy is bleeding on the sidewalk, but I'm at 58 minutes. I got to finish the last two minutes or I'm not right with God before I can go help the guy. Now that sounds foolish. I mean, I'm exaggerating. But that, Jesus uh, really came against a lot of things like that. A lot of things. And we like, and I said this last week, and it, it's worth repeating, one of the reasons that we like organizations and churches is because we like joining organizations that have a list of do's and don'ts that remove the gray areas for us. In of itself, that's not all bad. But where that's bad is when we get down to the motive level where what I'm doing is not to be pleasing to the Lord, it's to exalt myself above another person. Is this meddling a little bit today? I know that it is. It's a little heavier than, than, than I usually keep it. But we have to always, we have, like I said, we've got to give both sides of the story here. So that's not to remove those things of conscience. That's not to remove those things that are black and white because they are most assuredly there. 
But that is to say, be careful that you're not simply wanting a list of creeds so that you can check off your top ten list and know that you're better than someone that only made it to eight. Is anyone with me this morning? Are you understanding this? We're, so it's not to say that they're, they're not there. Now let's go to some scripture here. Hebrews chapter 5. And we're going to begin to go forward. This is really just four simple points. Four simple points on how to make decisions in the gray areas. How to begin coming out of, of gray areas. Uh, building on what has already been stated. Hebrews chapter 5. Just a second in my new Bible to get over there. Hebrews 5, verse number 11. We have a great deal to say about this, and it is difficult to explain, since you have become too lazy to understand. How's that for meddling? <laughs> this is just what the Word says. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone else to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish good from evil." Now, that last phrase there, after the hyphen, is very important. Whose, descent, whose senses have been trained to distinguish good from evil. You know how when you really get good at something? Okay, just whoever they are, what they say is the people that are really good at something can't really teach it. There are people that are good at teaching things, and we need teachers. But then there are people that are good at doing things, and if you ask them how they did it, they can't really explain it. And usually the people that are the best at what they do can't explain what they do. They just know that they do it. That's what Yogi Berra, you know, that's what uh, his son wrote about his dad. You know, his dad could never, he wouldn't play baseball with him. He could never, you know, his son was also a professional baseball player. But he, he couldn't, and he was a good one too, he, could, he couldn't, explain it. He said, dad just did it. He was never a teacher. He just did it. He didn't know how he did it. He just did it. And it tends to be I, the best. When someone is the best at what they do, they can't. They just do it. They don't know how they, they're doers. Now, sometimes you use that as a negative. Those who can do, do, and those who can't teach. That's not what we're, we're trying to uh, accomplish with this point this morning, because we need teachers. It's one of the fivefold ministry gifts, right? Listed right up there with apostles, pastors, evangelists, and there's, there's teachers, right? For the, for the equipping of the saints for the ministry. So it's not removing teachers. We need them. But it is saying that there's a point at which you need to have your senses trained where you just intuitively, you just intuitively uh, know what to do. Some of that's a gifting, but most of that comes, comes from practice. You know, uh, if you were to uh, put Michael Jordan out on the basketball court, I'm sure he'd be pretty rusty from what he was in his glory days. But I'm pretty sure that if you put him out there with a bunch of high school, high school kids in a scrimmage, he would just intuitively still, he'd probably still whoop them. I don't know. You think? I don't know. And Why? Just because it's so ingrained into who he is, that was his life. It's still his life. Doesn't he own like a basketball team now or something or a foot, football? Is it a football team? I don't know. I'm getting too deep. I'm getting beyond my uh, skill level here. So, but he owns some professional team. I know that. But uh, intuitively, it's what? How did that happen? Well. He probably had the right temperament and the right psyche for that and the right physique for that. You can't deny that. But you know how that happened? Hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours on the basketball court. Yeah. That's how that happened. <laughs> He's also the guy that, I can't remember the exact quote, but he said, I've missed a lot more baskets than I've made. You just have to get back up and keep doing it, basically, was the gist of what Michael Jordan said. You know, if you look at all that he missed, he don't look very good. But if you look at what he made, he's the best to this day, arguably uh, the best in what he did. Why is it as believers when we, why is it that we perhaps don't take our Christian walk that seriously? We think that we got saved 
and now we're familyed in. And that, there is truth to that. We're, when the shout comes, we're going up if you've got faith in Jesus. But why do we live our life on the bench when, when, we, could just, when we could be perfecting our faith? We could be perfecting this. Um, you know, I, I just saw that someone, maybe one of you guys, posted it this morning on, on Facebook. We spend our time preparing for death. But why don't we spend our time preparing for eternity? Think about it. How much time, you know, if you, if you know that you're going to, if you get a prognosis that you're going to die in two weeks and the doctor says it's done, it's over for you, that next two weeks would be devoted towards preparing for death. Well, let me give you the prognosis. It's a one-way street unless Jesus comes first, you're dying, whether it's in two weeks or whether it's in 50 years, you're dying, and what you're going to face is eternity. Why, don't, why aren't we perfecting our Christian walk? Why would we just accept Christ as our Savior and know that we're saved? If it's sincere, we're saved regardless of condition. But why would we not then seek to become the best believer that we can? You know how that's going to happen? Hours on the court. It's going to happen by spending time in the Word. By seeking God. And in Hebrews here, that's what he's talking about. You, he's saying you ought to be teachers by now. You ought to, by now, but you need to, you still really have to be taught the elementary things. I'm still, are you kidding me? After 50 years in this thing, I'm still showing you how to put the bolt into the nut? Are you kidding me? Does that frustrate anybody? Yeah. If you've ever, now I, I get, we're not saying disabilities and whatever, but if, you, if you've ever been the boss and if you've just had someone that you've explained it and you've explained it and you've said, okay, maybe I'm just not explaining it right. So you've let somebody else explain it and you've just hit it from every angle. And then you're like, I don't know about this person. Is it that they're not getting it or that they're not listening or that they don't want to get it? Maybe it's just that maybe, uh oh, maybe it's just that they're not here for my benefit. Maybe they're here to cause chaos and discord. I don't, you know, you hate to believe that about a person, but maybe they're here for an alternate reason. After, don't, don't you start to think things like that over time? As believers, yet, yeah, look, believe me, we're going we're gonna to cover the frailty aspect of this by the grace of God. We understand that. But as believers, why are we not spending time on the court perfecting our faith, preparing for eternity? Yes, we're saved. That removes the, that removes the fear of hell. Thank God for that. But now let's become good at what we're doing. Now let's perfect our faith. Let's grow in it. Let's move from milk on to solid food. Let's move on to some solid food. Where Now, I'm not talking to you specifically. I'm speaking generally here. We're not targeting. We're generalizing. Let's be clear on that. But how about, how about the pastor can move on from that message onto something actual, some actual deep message instead of having to... Because, because we've been in this long enough that we get it. We get the nuances of it, you know. Here's one for you. Um, now, some of you are, are newer here, so I don't expect you to have all this. But when I say the word prosperity, those that have been here for a long time, for seven years with me, ought to know that what I mean is God-honoring wealth. Amen. I try to say God-honoring wealth. Sometimes I say prosperity. But those are interchangeable terms to me. Okay, now if you don't know me very well, and some of you don't, I understand that, then when we talk about prosperity... We got to go into a long ter discussion about Kenneth Copeland and Joel Osteen's house and Jesse Duplantis' airplane and how everybody don't need a beach house and God doesn't promise to make you rich. Okay, there's a place for that long, arduous discussion. But when we've been together for seven years and I say prosperity, you ought to intuitively know that I mean God honoring wealth. Do you understand that? Yeah. Prosperity is not a dirty word. Faith is not a dirty word. Same thing, we say the same thing about faith. You ought to, after you've spent some time with me, you ought to know that what I mean by faith is probably different than what a lot, than the negative, just a faith. But sometimes, and, and, and I get it, that I get it, 
we want to be clear because there's always miscommunications with one another and people. But this is what the writer of Hebrews, who is probably Paul, though we could argue that, is saying. He's saying, look, it's time to move on to the solid food. Let's quit going back over and over. He's not talking to the baby. He's not talking to the new believer. He's talking to the ones that have been in this for a long time. And he's saying, come on, it's time, time to grow up into this. All right, so um, we ought, we, how do we navigate the gray areas? Well, because we've been in this long enough that we can, we can smell a rat. We can, we can tell when, we can discern when something's not right, when something's not firing on all four cylinders. We can discern that. Not because we're being critical or vindictive or self-promoting, but because we've just done this a while. We've been in it a while, okay? Uh, some, you don't have to tell Michael Jordan how to make a free throw. He's got that, okay? He knows how to do that because he's been in it a while. You don't have to go into all the science of the free throw with Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, make a free throw. He understands. He does it, okay? Uh, and this is what God... We need to be perfecting our faith, okay? I would say... And you're welcome to disagree with this. But one of the reasons that God leaves some legitimate gray areas for us to learn to navigate is just that. He wants us to mature. He's never removed our free will, though he is still sovereign. Make no bones about it. He's sovereign. But he's never removed our free will. And he wants us to learn how to discern. He wants us to learn how to make decisions and navigate the gray areas through maturity. Now, okay, so how are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? First of all, four simple things. Don't worry, they're simple. It's taken a while to get to them, but they're simple. First of all, we're going to be grace-based. To go to 2 Peter 3.14, and I'm going to give you some scriptures here very quickly, and you'll grasp right onto this because it's so simple that a caveman could get it. I'll make you feel bad now if you don't get it, won't I? But you'll get it. It's so simple. First of all, be grace-based. How do we navigate the gray areas? Be grace-based. Okay, look at what he said here, and we'll read a little more. Let's go to verse 14 of 2 Peter 3 and read down for context's sake. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight and at peace. You know what that sounds like? Perfecting our faith. Preparing for eternity. Not just knowing that, hey, we escaped the fires of hell, that's enough. Okay. Verse 15. Also regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things in all of his letters. There are some matters that are hard to understand. Everybody say gray area. If you thought, now those of you that thought there's no such thing as a gray area, the Bible just countered that right there. It tells us right there that there are many things that are hard to understand. He says the untaught and the unstable will twist them to their own destruction as they also do the rest of the scriptures. Okay, what does that reveal to you? That navigating the gray areas has a lot to do with the character of a person. The motives. Do you want to know? The word says, oh, foolish man, do you want to know? And there are a lot of things that we choose to live in ignorance because we're afraid if we knew. And yet when we choose to live in ignorance because we're afraid what we would have to do if we knew, you know what that means? It means you know. Okay, verse 17. Therefore, dear friends, since you know this in advance, be on your guard so that you are not led astray by error of lawless people and fall from your own stable position. Now, here's the, here's the good part. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Okay, that's the CEB Bible. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, to Him be glory both now and forever. Uh, okay, so the point there is that we grow in the grace and what? The knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we nav learn to navigate gray areas? By grace. Okay? Learning the character. What, what, would, what would Jesus do? The old, 
the old saying? What, what would uh, Jesus do? Um, that, we just have to ask that question. I was just, I was trying to think, I was trying to remember this because I wasn't planning it, but uh, one of the reasons that the, the South lost the Civil War, I believe it was at Gettysburg, where the one general, though he knew what Robert E. Lee would have done, didn't do it. He held back for, he held back for, Buford, good, good, General Buford, held back. And if he would have done what he knew Lee wanted, the war might have turned out different. Okay? Well, we grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Really, if we've been in this thing for a while and we've been walking with Jesus, we ought to be able to, even if we don't have a thus saith the Lord, we ought to be able to determine by the Lord's character what Jesus would do, right? Right? I mean, what would Jesus do? And we got to grow in, in grace with that. Now, we got to be grace-based with ourselves as well as with other people. That means that a lot of things that we do in navigating the gray areas is we need to learn to be forgiving of people. They don't have perhaps the same experience that we've had. They don't have perhaps the same knowledge of the word that we've had. We don't want to beat them over the head with the word, right? We want to, but we want to be sympathetic and understanding, realizing that we either were in that place or we easily could be in that place, there but for the grace of God go I. So we want to be grace-based, and we just want to communicate the message. Now, one of the things that the Lord has spoken to me a lot about, and people often say, and I hear this actually quite a lot, that there's always a positive type slant on my messages. I have a hard time going dark and deep. Well, that's because one of the things that I feel like, you can agree with this or not, this is just up to you, but I feel like one of the things that the Lord put in my heart a long time ago is tell them what you're for, not everything you're against. Tell them what you're for, not everything that you're against. You see, because what the Pharisees would do, you knew what, the, there was no gray area with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders. And they were good religious people. They gave their tithe. They fasted twice a week. They followed the commandments, literally, religiously. They were the leaders. And they were, there was a level of blessing that they had because of those things that they were doing. Now, in their heart, Jesus said, you're vipers and you're whitewashed tombs because your motives are all backwards and they're wrong. And he said, you've done all these other matters of the law, but you've neglected the weightiest matter of the law, which is love. All right? But do you see the difference between Jesus and the Pharisees? They had blacks and whites. They had no gray areas. They were living religiously. But here's what they were afraid of. You knew what they were against. You absolutely, remember the woman caught in adultery? You knew that they were against that. Uh, you, remember uh, the people that didn't pay their tithes? You knew that what they were, you knew what the Pharisees were against. And what they were against was the right things. It was very clean, cut, and dry. They were against the right things. But here was the problem with that. They were so afraid that the world was going to rub off on them that they wouldn't get in the world. And most of the world said, Amen. Because when they come along, they just want to wear their long flowing robes and they want to, you know, tell us the homily of the day and they want to, you know, they want to take from us. And what, what they held as truths were truths, and they were not bad, but they weren't mixed with faith, and they weren't done in love. And Jesus said that makes the whole thing into a viper's nest. And then Jesus, so you had the Pharisees, that they, they didn't want to get in the world because they were afraid the world would rub off on them. Then you had Jesus that knew that if I get in the world, they're not rubbing off on me, I'm rubbing off on them. See the difference? Jesus believed exactly what the Pharisees believed. They were almost identical in belief system. The difference was the Pharisees thought, the world will rub off on me. Jesus thought, uh-uh, I will rub off on the world. Completely, completely different mode of, opera, mode of, operandus, mode of operation. Completely different. And so the Pharisees would say, you're a prostitute, man. You can't come in here. Jesus says, I'll go to the prostitute. I won't be sleeping with her, but I'll be going to her. He was attracted not to the lifestyle of the culture. Jesus was not any more attracted to the sin of the culture than the Pharisees were. He just refused to live in fear of it rubbing off on him. 
Now we're talking, this, we're talking about navigating the gray areas. I have not forgotten the, the uh, subject area this morning. See, as believers, we do, there, when you get down to it, there are some things that ain't happening. There are some things that are, they're cut and dry, and they're in my belief system, and I'm against them, and it's just not happening in my house, or in my world, or in my car, or anywhere. There, there are just things that aren't happening, and that's fine. But Every time I encounter the world, they shouldn't be encountered with what I'm against. They, they should be encountered with what I'm for. Do you see this? Now, when we get down to it, you'll hear what I'm against. Jesus was against sin. He, woman, go and sin what? No more. When you get down to it, Jesus would always tell you what he's against when you get down to it. But he never made what he was against be the obstacle between the world and him. Always what they heard first was what I am for. Man, be on your guard. Do not be a believer that everybody knows what you're against, but they can't tell you one thing that you're for. Ooh. The word's powerful, isn't it? The word is, the word is so powerful. And we need... what Christ didn't use the hope of glory. Now, okay, so we're talking about being... On this point, grace-based, as we navigate the gray areas. And the word says, I, I don't want to go over there. You know the passage pretty well. But it says in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. And it goes on to say that the Lord is mindful that we are but dust. He understands that we're just dust. He understands that we're going to miss the basket sometimes. That we're going to fumble the football. He understands that we're going to mess up. And sometimes we're going to mess up in very bad ways. It's very uncomfortable to talk about this, isn't it? But you know what? And if I'm wrong about this, I might as well hand in my minister's card because I know I'm not wrong about this. If I'm wrong about this, my entire worldview is wrong. And someone will probably send me a message on YouTube telling me it is wrong, but it's not. The thing is, God would rather have you out there living in the world, rubbing off on them and failing, than have you sitting in your church pew two hours a week in the safety of your house, never interacting with the world, and in a sense, never failing because you're never out in the world. See, the Pharisees, the Pharisees didn't interact because they didn't want the world to rub off. Oh, you're putting yourself in danger. You might fail. You might fall into sin. You might fall into sin. You might fail. But I'm convinced God would, if you're going for God, God would rather have you fail because when you fail, He'll pick you back up. Amen. Rather than living in your ivory tower, your ivory palace. But we've got to be grace-based. Now, okay, we've got to start with grace. This is not a book of laws. This is a book of grace. There are laws to it. We said it in the beginning. The laws haven't gone anywhere. There are laws, but they are laws that are fulfilled through grace. Okay. The next thing after being grace-based, and I'm on number two, finally, point number two, the next thing is consider the consequences. We do have to consider the consequences. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Consider the consequences. What's the impact? And again, this is where we perfect our faith. We get good at this. Uh, already aforementioned, we fail sometimes. But if we're in the world, living for Jesus, and we fail sometimes, we've got to be grace-based. We've got to forgive ourselves. We've got to forgive others. God will certainly forgive us if we ask Him. He's very merciful. But we've got to consider the consequences. When we are living in gray areas or facing gray areas, let's ask the question, how does this impact other, other people? Because Jesus said that, or Paul said that here. Uh, you know, how does that impact other people? Let us esteem the other one better than ourselves. In this gray area, will my decision esteem the other person better than it'll do? Is it better for me or is it better for you? That's really the, one of the hard questions that we have to ask. Who's it better for? In most gray areas, if we ask that question... Is it better for them? I think the gray area just cleared up. 
in most of them. Uh, we have to consider the consequences. There are consequences to decisions. We have to con consider that. Um, we also have to, I want to take that a step further, and we have to ask what I consider the most difficult question in my life. You ready for the hardest question that I ask myself? And I'm, not, I'm totally serious about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 23 through 24. You can read it. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 24. This is not for the faint-hearted. This is not for people that just want status quo. This is not for those that want to be saved and only to escape the fires of hell. This is for those who want to perfect their faith and learn to navigate the gray areas of life. Okay, here's the hard question. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but rather the interest of others. The hard question is, is this beneficial or is it only permissible? That's a place that's not comfortable to go. But in asking that question, most of the gray areas of your life just cleared up if you want them to. Is this beneficial or is it only permissible? That's a hard question. I believe that's the hardest question that we face. As, if I can use the word mature believers, that's the hardest question we face. It's not, should I pray today? Will God forgive me? It's not, you know, uh, should I help the guy with a flat tire? As a mature those are not hard questions for us. We've been in this thing for a while. The hard question for us is, is this going to be beneficial or is it just permissible? And if it's just permissible, okay, God, <laughs> my flesh don't like it, but if it's just permissible, help me to, by the grace of God, make the choice to take the higher road. It's really what it is. It's the decision between taking the higher road, not the lower road, and saying, yeah, this is permissible, I can justify it, but I'm going to not go with what's permissible, I'm going to go with what's beneficial. I'm going to go with what's, what's done in love. I really believe it's the hardest question that we ask as mature quote, mature believers. It's the hardest question that we ask. Is this permissible only, or is this also beneficial? And we don't like that. I'd like to be a little more optimistic and say that we do, but you're lying because you don't like it, because there's a lot of things that you like that don't, that just, you don't want to ask that question on. Am I, I can tell, I can see your faces. We're, we, I can tell. Is it, is it permissive? But what are, again, what are we preparing for? Are we preparing just for death and thank God we escaped hell, which no little thing, amen? No little thing. But once we're in this thing, once we're in the family, once we're in, in the priesthood of believers, then we need to start asking, is it beneficial or is it only permissible? Right? Amen. Amen. It's a good question. I don't really even feel like I need to say much about it. Like I said, it's simple. It's, but it's simple, but it's profound to ask that question. And then I've touched on this, but the last thing that we need to do to navigate the gray areas is simply to practice. Simply to practice in making spiritual decisions. You know, you can't do that unless you're grace-based because you're going to fail. But thank God you didn't wreck the Starship Enterprise, right? So you can't do that unless you're grace-based, you, you can't be free to practice being anything but grace-based. You can't be free uh, to practice without considering the consequences. You can't be free to practice without uh, asking the question, is this beneficial or only permissible? But when, when you've settled those things in the gray areas of life, when you've settled those things you can now begin to practice, and you can practice with confidence. The word says in 2 Timothy 2, it's rapid fire here on a few verses, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, but is rightly dividing the word of truth. Proverbs 24.16, for a righteous man may fall seven times, but he will always rise again. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. Psalm 121.3, He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. 
How do we navigate the gray areas? They're there. They're certainly there. Now, as I said in review, the number one thing is being in the Word because the Word clears up a lot of them. But when we get down into those things that really are gray areas, how do we face these things? Number one, we're grace-based. Uh, number two, we consider the consequences of our actions. Number three, we ask ourselves the hardest question. Is it only permissible or is it also beneficial? And then the fourth thing, we just get out and practice. We do it. The Lord would rather you be out on the field. Amen? You'd rather, he'd rather you be out on the field practicing. You know, if... Well, I, I don't, you get the point. He'd rather you be out on the field practicing than be sitting on the bench. You know, it's easy to be an arm, armchair quarterback, isn't it? It's easy to sit on the bench, to be sitting in the stands. And we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, the word says. But they're watching us, okay? And it's, it's our turn on the field right now. Oh, help me, Jesus. We've got to leave it on the court. We've got to, you know, the, if you're paying somebody, you know, $5 million a year to play basketball or whatever you're, they're getting paid, you're going to tell them, man, you better be leaving it on the court. If you're not going to leave it on the court, there's about 30 kids behind you that can take your place that will leave it on the court with a little bit of hustle. Well, as believers, sometimes we forget what we're in this for, man. We're inheriting a kingdom. We're heirs, co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Thank God we've been saved from the fires of hell, but now it's time to perfect our faith. Are we leaving it on the court? I, I believe it was John Wesley who, man, he, he was a great man of God, as you know, John Wesley. And his brother Charles Wesley uh, wrote a lot of the hymns. Charles wrote the hymns. John was one of the great revival preachers. But John Wesley had a lot of tough times in his family because he was always gone. And some people criticized him for that. But he would not and they said his wife was just the meanest thing ever. They really did the history books say that she was. And yet John Wesley, he would not let it deter him from preaching the gospel, from doing the task that God gave. He left it on the court. And if I'm getting this correct, John Wesley died with a pocket watch and a 50 cent piece to his name. You say, well, that was a failure. No, not at all. That was not a failure. That was a man that was going to leave it on the court. There's always going to be a lion in the path. There's always going to be a cloud in the sky. There's always going to be, you know, a circumstance. There's always going to be not enough money. There's always going to be, you know, a health brother. Are we leaving it on the court? Are we perfecting our faith? Are we giving it to God? That's what the call is today. Now, I want to leave you with just one last thing, and then we're going to, I know we're getting close. We got to, we're going to have the joy of receiving communion. But I want to leave you with one last thought this morning. And it's the best one of all. It's a springboard to what we're, we're talking about later maybe, but you, you ready for the best news of all? We have the shepherd. We have the shepherd. And the shepherd has us. That is the greatest confidence in the gray areas. We have the shepherd He's never going to let us get behind on the reach of his staff. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We have the shepherd. When the wolves are out there hiding in the mist, the lions, the, the bears, when the icebergs are there and the, the rocks that would shipwreck our faith, the good news is that we have the shepherd. Amen? Amen. And as his sheep, we will hear his voice. Sometimes he has to speak a little loud, doesn't he? But we will hear his voice as his sheep, and we don't ever need to be, be afraid. I would like you to take your hymnal and turn to page 369. For the last two weeks, we've talked about navigating the gray areas. A little darker subject than I sometimes like to take on, but it's a real thing that we're facing in our culture. We've been equipped with some tools to navigate the gray areas, but the greatest one, though I've said the least about it because it's a whole series in its own, is that we have the shepherd. Go ahead, Josiah.